Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, so let's get started. I hope that we are on video. Uh, I'm Ben Lifshitz. So we have a visitor today, um, Nick Nikofarakis from uh, KU Leuven at the moment, but soon to be at UC Santa Barbara, as far as I know. Uh, so he's going to talk to us about web uh, fingerprinting. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know about that last part. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for being here, and thank you, Ben, for inviting me. Um, so the title is, yeah, everything you always want to know about web-based device fingerprinting, but we're afraid to ask. I'm not very honest because there's a lot of things that you would like to know and I will not cover because I just, we don't know yet. So, but I'll try to give you a good introduction. So I'm a postdoc researcher at KU Leuven. I work mainly on web security and privacy, although I have done a bit of heap overflows in the past. And what I like to do in the web is I like to look at the web as clusters of services and identify the ecosystems of these clusters. And there, um, enumerate the players, the interactions between the players, and search for systematic problems within the services. So this fingerprinting work is also a type of ecosystem work. So you can keep this in mind. Um, so you may have seen a similar slide in the past. This is an article from the New York Times. And uh, the content that is highlighted with red is all third party content, right? So it's not coming from the servers of the New York Times. It's coming from various advertising servers and social um, networking servers. And every time that you ask for content from a third party server, that server has the ability to uh, set cookies to you. And these are called third party cookies because it's not the New York Times that gave them to you, but a website or a banner within New York Times. And when you go to another website that is affiliated with the same advertising agencies, then you will send back the cookies that they gave you and then they create browsing profiles of you. So they know that you went to the New York Times and to uh, you know, another 1,000 websites. And they can use this information to sell um, to do more, well, better targeting of ads. So this is, um, this is not exactly new, but it's still very interesting um, because uh, there's a lot of companies that people don't know about uh, that are very, very popular in terms of uh, being included over third party in the web. So we did a la study last year for CCS for just who remotes JavaScript, who includes JavaScript from whom. And we found, for example, that in the top 10, there are these three companies that are providers of JavaScript libraries. And these guys, they give some functionality to uh, website administrators like, like uh, analytics, but in return, they get data. So um, it's QuantServe scored car research and add this. And chances are that if you're not doing some sort of privacy related research that you don't know them because simply people, they don't have a first party relationship with any of these three sites. So, but this is, as I said, this is not really news. So today I want to talk to you that and convince you that tracking involves more than just third party cookies. So, um, for the purposes of this talk, fingerprinting is the ability to tell users apart based on the browsing environments without using any extra stateful identifiers. So no flash cookies, no e-tags, no cache tricks, nothing like that. Uh, I'm going to, to present to you some of the results from a, th from a thorough study of current fingerprinting practice on the web. And I'm, I also hope to convince you that it's really, really ha hard today to hide the true nature of your browser and, and how this relates to fingerprinting. So, Today, people, they know more about cookies than they used to know. So according to a 2011, I think, study from Comscore, a third of users delete their first party and third party cookies within a month after being set up. Um, and that's a problem because as an advertiser, if you rely on cookies uh, to track people around, then you sort of, every once in a month, you lose your, your browsing profile for that user. Um, also, you have this now, uh, this increased interest in self-help extensions in browsers. And you have Ghosted and Lightbeam, and I will show them in the next slide what they are and what they do. And you also have the, the private mode of browsers that users can go in and out in order not to keep uh, track of their data, of, the, you know, of cookies and stuff that websites give for certain websites that, that they don't want to keep their data on their machines. So, um, so this is the well, a relevant or I hope relevant site for you, redmondreporter.com. Uh, and here you can see Ghostery, which is this plugin, this extension rather, that um, has this long list of third party trackers and it tells you what it finds on each page. So here you can see, for instance, that Ghostery found 10 trackers on uh, the Redmond Reporter. And you could do various things from here, like check out what specific scripts they found from these guys and also blacklist them if you want to. And then you have Lightbeam, which is 
uh, from Mozilla. Uh, and Lightbeam does something different. It tries to connect uh, different parties in terms of uh, tracking. So you see here, for instance, that you have the uh, redmondreporter.com, and you have this other uh, Greek, I'm Greek, so Greek news website. Uh, and they are connected through Facebook. So when you do go to these sites, Facebook will be included in both. And Facebook will know that you, as an individual, went to the New York, to the, well, to the Red Moon Reporter and then to the Greek news website. And here's also CNN, and you see common connections. So as you browse the web, these connections increase. And essentially, if you let this on for a while, you will see that websites are much more connected to each other than you would like to think. So this is all about cookies. But um, what if today, today I could tell you that um, interested parties could track users without the need of cookies or any other stateful client-side identif client identifiers? Uh, as a bonus, this is hidden from users, so there is no dialogue for you to inspect of all the various cookies that are given to you and delete them maybe. And it's also hard to avoid it or opt out. So you cannot just click on something and say, I don't want third-party cookies anymore because that's not relevant. So this is web-based device fingerprinting. And this gained, uh, gained popularity first in 2010 from Peter Eckersley. He wrote a paper of uh, like how unique is your browser. And there he showed that certain attributes of your browsing environment can be combined in order to track you. And he said that essentially, if you combine them the right way, they create a kind of unique fingerprint for you. And so how does this work? So Eckersley said that you come to my website, and then I first ask your browser a couple of questions, like, you know, who are you? Are you Firefox? Which version are you? Which platform do you run on? Uh, then if you have JavaScript enabled, and you do know that almost all users do, then Eckersley would keep on asking a few questions through JavaScript. So he would, for example, say, what is the width and the height of your monitor? Uh, then he would ask, what is the time zone that you're currently located in, all successful through JavaScript? Then he would ask for a list of plugins from your system, like the Adobe Reader, some your Java plugins, maybe uh, your Flash plugin. And then if Java or Flash were installed, then he would actually get a list of the fonts on your system. Because Java and Flash, they have the ability to, they have this API that they provide to the applications. You can ask for the, for the fonts that are installed on a user system. And then he would also have some super cookie checks, like could he set a global storage or a local storage cookie. So he found out that in a half a million users that participated in this study, from the ones that had Java or Flash enabled, so for the ones that he could get fonts from, 94.2 were uniquely identifiable. So essentially, almost no two users in 94.2 had all these attributes the same. Okay? And he also showed that you could use a simple, heuristic, uh, hu simple heuristics algorithms to track local changes in fingerprint. So if your user agent changes, but your fonts don't, and other things don't, then maybe I can infer that it's still you with an updated browser rather than a new person with a new fingerprint. Uh, I can, yes? Question. So do you believe that number, that 94% number, I, I don't know. So I'm just, I'm using, you know, related work to position myself here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, what I can show you in connection to that is that PanopticClick is still available online, so you can try it from your own machines. And I tried here this morning with my own. And, you know, it said that my browser fingerprints appears to be unique in now 3.6 million users installed. And if you kind of look at, you know, what goes into my um, fingerprint, you can see here, for instance, my user agent, which is this one, which, you know, it's not really that unique. So one in 310 users share the identical user agent. But then, and, you know, the same for your accept headers. But then this long list of things here, these are the list of plugins on my machine, right? Not extensions, plugins. So I didn't choose to install any of these. Um, so, and here you can see that this is like a ridiculously high amount of entropy, and essentially no other user has everything identical. So these are the names of plugins, their versions, and a human readable description, everything concatenated in one string. And you get a similar result for fonts, right? So you see here that um, only one in you know, 600,000 users have, this, have all these fonts identically as I have. So that's what Eckersley said back in 2010, and that was very interesting. So what can you use, you know, what can you use fingerprinting for? So the first and obvious thing is ads. Uh, there, are no there are no cookies for you to delete. There is no check to say that I don't want third-party cookies in my browser. So now I can just connect your browsing profile. Instead of connecting it to a cookie, I can connect it to your fingerprint. So I can uh, maintain 
the list of websites that you have visited regardless of what you do, regardless of what you delete client side. And I can do the same even if you enter in your private mode because your fingerprint does not change uh, when you enter the private mode because nothing, has, nothing is different. Everything is still there in the same way. The second thing, and this is the more positive way of looking at things, is that you can use it for anti-fraud. So your bank is tracking you for a year, and they know that you log in from a Linux machine, and they know you use Firefox, and they know you, you, know, you log in during the morning, for instance. They can add timestamp information. If suddenly you log in at night you know, from a Mac, uh, from, let's say, well, Indonesia, then something may be wrong. So, and then they would say, you know, please verify that it's you and it's not someone who has stolen your credentials. Uh, then we, have, we found that um, some companies use fingerprinting for paywalling. So there's these websites, for example, art, uh, news sites that you can, read, you can read 10 articles for free. But if you would like to read more, then you have to pay some sort of subscription. So if, if they would do that tracking with cookies, then you just delete your cookies and you read another 10, and then you, know, you go on and on. However, you, they could use uh, fingerprinting to do the paywalling so that you can, there's nothing for you to delete once you're done reading your 10 articles because the fingerprint is part of who you are. And finally, um, this happened in the summer. There was this attack against an outdated, uh, well, Tor browser. Uh, there was a Firefox vulnerability. And the people analyzed the, the payload, and they saw that it essentially fingerprinted a bit of the user system, and it sent that fingerprint to a remote server. And the most plausible theory at this point is that there were feds that they were doing this, trying to identify which users from the Tor network are visiting certain shady websites or non-shady. Um, so there's a lot of you know, interesting intrusive and less intrusive um, uses of fingerprinting. So in 2012, which is when we started doing this research, what we knew is that you know, what Eckersley had said, and we also knew that there was like, some companies that were quite vocal that they were offering fingerprinting as a service. So what we wanted to find out is how you know, how are these companies doing it? So are they, doing, are they relabeling Panoptic League as their own product, or are they adding something more to it? Uh, the question is then, could they do more? You know, could they, if necessary, could they fingerprint you more than they do today? Uh, then we want to find out the user base, so which websites are buying services from this fingerprinting as a service companies. Uh, and the question then, the last one was, like, how are users trying to hide? So what do, what do people do in order to protect themselves against fingerprinting, and if it's working for them? So, um, yeah, so this talk is essentially two papers in one. Uh, if, you, if you want to know more, this is the first one, Cookieless Monster, published in Security and Privacy this year, and the second one, FB Detective, published in CCS this year. So that's that. Uh, so we started our work by analyzing the code of these three vocal companies uh, that, you know, that said that we offer fingerprinting and you can use it for all cool things. And this is what we did. So we first found the domains that they use to serve the fingerprinting scripts. So, Essentially, most of them, they advertise the fact that it's very, you can uh, adopt fingerprinting in a very straightforward way. You just dump a bit of JavaScript code in your page, and now you're fingerprinting your clients. Um, so then we found some websites that use them. We extracted the code. We isolated it from the code of the website. We deobfuscated and analyzed the code of these three services, and then we compared the code to each other, and we created some sort of taxonomy to find out where every company stands. And of course, you know, companies are not really eager to share the fingerprinting code with us. So most of them, this is actually a real part of, of the code that we had to look at manually. Um, so the results is, are that um, we, we were able to create this um, taxonomy, as I said, compare each company to each other. And the th there were quite some interesting findings. So the first one was that collectively, panoptically, was fully covered. So it, it usually is that the industry is a bit behind academia. In this case, they were really up to date. You know, what Eckersley had said in 2010, they were offering in their fingerprinting services. Uh, the classification, the taxonomy that we broke up is split up into these five levels. So you see you can start from fingerprinting things in your browser customizations, fingerprinting uh, features at the browser level user configuration, fingerprinting your browser family inversion, fingerprinting your operating system and applications, and finally fingerprinting the hardware network. And here you see these things here are all new things over what Eckersley was doing in 2010. So for instance, for uh, Internet Explorer, Internet Explorer does not um, share its plugins. So there is no uh, navigator.plugins uh, plugins property in JavaScript that one can use to read all the plugins. So what they were doing is they had this very long list of class identifiers, and they were just enumerating one by one. Do you have that? Do you have that? Do you have that? Do you have that? In order to get you know, a partial list of the fingerprints, I'm sorry, of the class IDs that were installed on that browser. 
Uh, then in the browser level user configuration, we saw that they were actually, one company was tracking the do not track choice, right? So that's a bit interesting. Uh, they were reading the fact whether you want to be tracked or not, and they were adding it as part of your fingerprint, okay? Um, then they, uh, a company was also reading math constants from your JavaScript engine and was incorporating these math constants into your fingerprint. And we assume that this was, that they are doing this in an effort to separate um, JavaScript engines from each other. So if you're di different in, you know, in the floating points of something, then I may be able to identify the browser that houses this JavaScript engine. And then we also found, interestingly, that they were fingerprinting the Windows registry and TCP IP parameters. And of course, the question is, you know, how do they do that? Because JavaScript cannot look into your Windows registry, nor into your TCP IP parameters. And just, you know, stick with me and I'll tell you. So uh, the non-trivial extras that we found is the first thing is that we found non-plugin font detection. So if you remember Eckersley, he had to rely on JavaScript, I'm um, sorry, on Flash or Java in order to get a list of fonts from your machine. However, one company was doing the following. Uh, all of this, of course, in an invisible iframe. It was creating these long strings. For instance, I do not need flash. It, they were setting the Arial typeface, and they were measuring the box around it, the, uh, the width and the height of the box, which essentially means the width and the height of the text. And once they get this number, then they have this long list of fonts, and they keep on doing the same operation, right? So because of stylistic differences on each um, font family, the same string on the same font size it will add up to a different height and a different width uh, than Arial, right? So, and Arial is used by your browser as a fallback font. So if I ask for a fancy font and you don't have it, Arial will be used to display the text. So every time that a font measurement was different than Arial, it meant that the font was present, and thus it was used to, you know, to render the text in the screen. So by doing this for like 200, 300, 400 fonts, they could get a list of fonts through JavaScript, through a side channel essentially attack, in JavaScript without needing Flash or Java. The second thing that we found, and this is essentially you know, how they access your registry, is that we found for two companies that they have native fingerprinting plugins. So once we're, we're looking at the code and we saw that when they're checking for the plugins installed, um, they have this specific check for whether a specific plugin is present. And if it is, it is loaded and you know, handed off control. Uh, we were able to isolate these plugins and analyze them using Anubis. Um, and we saw that there were essentially plugins that were existing on the user system for the sole purpose of fingerprinting him better, right? And this is not, these are not extensions, so these are plugins. And they run with the same privileges uh, as the browser process itself. So that plugin could look into your registry. Uh, and they were reading things like your, um, the installation date of your Windows, uh, your device drivers, your IP address, and your uh, host name. Uh, and we were able essentially to find that um, these native fingerprinting plugins, they were usually bundled with something that you downloaded and silently installed in the back. So, and essentially bundled with uh, casino applications and maybe second life type applications. Um, the third thing is that there are interesting fingerprint delivery mechanisms. So, you know, how do you offer fingerprinting as a service? And we saw essentially two different modes. The first one was that um, the remote code was brought in from the fingerprinter. Uh, it fingerprinted the user, and then it added the fingerprint in the DOM of the first party page. So for instance, on IMVU, when you're, when, while the user is sort of waiting for the page to log in so that he can type in his, his username and password, he's being fingerprinted. The fingerprint is added in the, as a hidden element in the form, in the login form. And once you click Submit, you're sending your username and password and your fingerprint to IMVU. Uh, and the second mode was that um, the first party side was saying, fingerprint the user, here's the session identifier. And then the, the fingerprinting service, it was fingerprinting the user, but it wasn't sending the, the fingerprints to the first party service, it was sending it to itself. And then we understand, as we understand, using the session identifier at the server side later, they will be able to say, what do you know about user you know, with that session identifier? And they will get back information about that user. And the final thing that I will talk to you was essentially proxy detection. So um, there's this interesting thing. So the thing that we saw is the following. We saw that um, for, I think it was two companies, they were loading JavaScript and Flash. They were creating these long random strings. They were exchanging them between each other. And then they were, you know, they were just sending these strings to the fingerprinting server. Now what happens in JavaScript is if you have, like for, uh, for example, an HTTP proxy, your request will go through the proxy. So, 
if this is the, you know, the generated token, which is exchanged through JavaScript and Flash, it will go through the proxy server. So when the request reaches the fingerprinting server, it will come from the IP address of the proxy server. However, Flash has the ability to open direct connections, in, you know, ignoring your browser level um, proxies. So you had another token that was sent directly to the fingerprinting server. So now at the fingerprinting server, you see two requests coming in from two different IP addresses with the same long uh, alphanumerical token. So now you can say, OK, that's actually the same user. He's coming from two different IP addresses because he's using a proxy. This is his normal IP address, and this is his proxy. And you can incorporate this information in the fingerprint. OK, so if we move to adoption, we're interested. OK, this is how they work, who is using them. We crawl the top 10,000 sites quite shallowly. Uh, and we're searching for inclusions from these three fingerprinting providers. And we found at the time, so uh, 40 sites that were using them. Uh, and the categories were mostly, well, they were across all borders, but porn and dating sites were most prominent. Right? We sent emails to these people saying, you know, why are you using fingerprinting? Only one dating site replied. For the rest, we just, you know, this is our best guess. So for porn sites, our theory is that they are trying to detect the use of shared credentials. So you have a user. Yes? When you say most prominent, are we talking about a percentage? Uh, yes. So from the categories, the two top categories were porn and dating sites. Okay. That would cover what, 50%, 80% of the um, So you mean cover the total of the dating sites present in the 10,000 or the total of the 10,000? Uh, the total of the 10,000. Uh, well, it's 40 sites in total, so uh, yeah, that would be a percentage of these 40. Yeah. So for porn sites, they're trying to identify shared credentials. They don't want one user buying a subscription and sharing it with 10 friends, right? They want one user per subscription. So they're using fingerprinting to protect themselves. And for dating sites, one site replied to us and they said that they, they don't want people to have multiple profiles, you know, because then they, they game the system. They want one user to have one dating profile. So they use, um, Fingerprinting, again, to identify multiple users hiding between, uh, well, single user hiding between, uh, behind multiple usernames. And at the time, Skype.com was the highest ranking website fingerprinting its users, OK, when you try to log in. Yes? Did you ask the question to Skype and yes. get a response? No. Yeah. Are they still using? Um, you said at the time. Yes, so this was done in 2012. I think they are. Can you check and then let us know, and then maybe we can follow up? Sure. They are, to their credit, they're only using it at their login page. So if you would go to Skype.com, you will not see anything. But if you try to go to login, that's when you get, that's when the shared li the JavaScript library is loaded right. and it's fingerprinting you. The login page is now Microsoft account because it got rid of the Skype okay. account. <coughs> I'll be happy to check it if you want right afterwards. What do you think, Javier? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, then, you know, that was for popular sites. Then since, you know, we did this work with UCSB, uh, we had access to the domains from WebAWET. And WebAWET is this high interactive um, um, honeypot that is used to find JavaScript malware in web pages. And we just searched, you know, what are the domains that when analyzed loaded code from these fingerprinting providers? And we found 3,800 domains. The first thing is that when we got their categories, you know, that they span a lot of categories. So you had shopping sites that use fingerprinting, travel, internet services, business, and economy. Um, the second thing that was more, very interesting was that the two top categories were malicious sites and spam sites. Okay? So malicious sites and spam sites, when analyzed by WebAWET, were loading JavaScript from these fingerprinting providers. Okay? The, what makes this a bit more interesting is that um, these three companies, they don't offer you know, free previews of their services. And you can't go online and just grab f fingerprinting services. You have to meet with a sales representative. So the question now is the following. Are malicious sites and spam sites using, you know, just grabbing the JavaScript libraries? Because, and you know, they can't use it because they're not paying these services, but they're just doing it as a smoke screen for something? Or is it something else? And you know, we, just, we just let it at that. I don't know any one of the three companies that went answer this question. So um, that, is, that was the first paper. Then the question was the following. We know how these three companies work. You know, we analyze them. We did the taxonomy. But are there more? You know, are there more that were less vocal, that were not included in uh, surveys? And the question is, how do you find more? So if you were to do some sort of dynamic analysis, let's say you, know, you look at things loaded, how do you separate, for instance, a, a fingerprinting script from a generic analytics screen? Okay? Because 
if I have Google Analytics or, or Stat Counter or something else, it will also look whether I have flash. It will also see at my sc uh, screen size. But you know, how do you tell one from the other? And the thing we, we, our conclusion was that we can actually look at fonts. So according to Eckersley's experiment, fonts were the second most revealing thing checked. Um, it was the second most revealing attribute of your fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. So we said that if a script you know, passes this threshold and it goes and, and now ask, starts asking questions of fonts on your machine, then we treat this as a fingerprinting script. So um, yeah, this is what I just said. Our paper and our tool that is available online is essentially FP Detective, a fingerprinting sensitive crawler, right? Uh, so you just, yes? Isn't there a good reason why some sites might want to know what fonts you have? Um, the reason, but the, so for example, I may want to display some text to you, maybe using three or four font faces, but why would I ask for 400? Sure, but you did say you were, you did say your threshold was they were right. So we did not. Hundred fonts. Yeah, we did not. Uh, this was an exploratory study, so we did not know what sort of threshold to do to you know to set. So what we did is we just we recorded everyone that asked for fonts. And then we manually analyzed and said, OK, these guys, they're using the fonts, for example, in order to show text on the screen, so we remove them. It's, it's a, like a helper tool to identify more fingerprinters rather than you know, an autonomous system that will tell you for sure that this guy right there is fingerprinting you. OK, so you're not just making this? No. Okay. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question. So um, what's the adverse effect of blocking all those kind of probing requests? So I assume that you know, like legitimate servers you know, want to find out mm -hmm. plugins and fonts and stuff. But you know, let's say that you block all those right. requests, probably it should be still OK. This is one of the research questions that having the end. The answer is I don't know. Um, well, I was saving this for the end, but I can tell you now. So if I constantly, um, if I constantly reject your scripts, OK, is it possible that I actually make myself fingerprintable in the long run? Um, because you know, there's that guy from Microsoft Research every single day with that browser who is not loading our JavaScript files. And then I'm, I'm again singled out simply because I'm not loading scripts. And this is just an open question right now. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, yeah. So the detection of font snooping, we just, you know, using our results from Cookie List Monster, we said, how can we detect fonts? OK, they have two ways of grabbing them. They have the JavaScript based, you know, with the measuring the width and the height. So let's modify the browser and add code when something is playing with the width and the height of, your, of, uh, of elements. Let's record that. And then for Flash, we just had a proxy that was grabbing all the Swift files, it was decompiling them, and it was just searching for the API calls in Flash that give back, you know, a, a list of fonts. So these are the old results. And with FP Detective, we saw actually 140 fingerprinting sites, 145 in the top Alexa 10,000. Uh, another experiment that we did is that we tried you know, one run with no do not track header and another one with do not track equals one. And we got the identical results. So we were fingerprinted 100% in both cases. So at this point, do not track does not matter in terms of fingerprinting. And companies actually, like Blue Kava is quite vocal about that. They say that if you're, a, you know, we use fingerprinting for ads and we use fingerprinting for fraud detection. If you're a bad guy, you can't just say do not track equals one because then, and you know, we cannot, we cannot honor that because then we will just stop tracking you. So we will fingerprint you, but we will not use the, your fingerprint for ads, right? So that's a promise that's very hard to, to verify because it's done server side. You're being fingerprinted identically at the client side. Um, so that's that. Well, yeah. Can, you can look at the ads that you're getting to see if So yeah, that would be a, a side ads. effect, sort of. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. That's what uh, Lori did some study. At CMU, people did right. it. Right. OK, so for fingerprinting, or in general, for third party well, tracking? In general. <coughs> this, I think, if the DNT makes a difference. Right. OK, I would, be, I would like to get a but point. It was at the, um, the workshop, the yeah. web security and privacy workshop. Okay. OK, I'll check it out. So the status at this point is that you know, fingerprinting is out there. There's quite a number of new techniques over Panopticlick. We know that large and popular sites are using them. Not too many, but they're still getting millions of visitors per day since they are in the Alexa top 10,000. Uh, so the question is the second one, that could they be doing more? So if they wanted to fingerprint a bit better, um, could they?
check more things. And the question essentially boiled down to us as to how, your, how, does, how do your browser internals relate to your browser's identity. And I will only, I think I'll just go over one thing. So uh, we decided to do some fingerprinting of our own. That's what we did. Uh, and we focused on, two, on the two special JavaScript objects that have historically attracted the most fingerprinting efforts. So the navigator object that has all the information about your browser, like your plugins, your user agent, your platform, and so on, and the screen that has information about the width and the height of your screen, the depth of colors. Um, and what we did is we just, you know, we're, we're everyday guys, so we just performed a series of everyday operations on these um, objects. We try to add properties to these special JavaScript objects. We try to remove properties, and we also try to modify properties. And these are special objects because they're created by the browser. They're not created by the, uh, you know, by a JavaScript program. So these are the better candidates to reveal browser-dependent behavior. Um, one of the things, probably my favorite one, uh, that we discovered is that the natural ordering of properties can give away browser family and occasionally browser version. So if you would go to Chrome, and you would say, please give me, you know, just list the uh, properties into the navigator object, then you would get navigator.geolocation.online.cookies enabled and so on. If you could ask the same question in Firefox, you suddenly get a different ordering here. So regardless of who the browser pretends to be, if, I, if through the ordering I get a different result, then I know that, you know, that that's who the browser is. Um, and here you see Internet Explorer, it started kind of similarly as with Firefox, but then deviated fast into its own ordering. Um, and that's a bit of an underspecified, you know, uh, thing, the, the ordering of elements in an array, uh, in a list rather, uh, in the, in BOM objects. So there's also more things, but I'll just skip them for today. So the question is now, you know, there is more that fingerprinting can do. We, we have, we, fingerprinters could do. How do users react? You know, how do people today, how are they told to react and how do they react themselves? And we looked at a few stuff today. I'll just talk to you about user agent, uh, sorry, user agent spoofing browser extensions. So we found essentially um, previous research as well as underground hacking guides that were telling, you know, just install this user agent spoofer and change your browser, your user agent, and then people will think that you're many, user, you know, that you're many machines behind a single IP address. So, we just went to each market, we searched for user agent spoofing, and we found uh, 11 uh, add-ons um, extensions in total with more than 800,000 users. Now they're more than a million. Um, the question is, how do they stand up against fingerprinting? And we tried to be fair, so we didn't use any of our newly founded, uh, of our newly discovered uh, techniques. We just sort of, we installed them and we looked at the navigator and the screen object, and we, you know, and we looked at these things before and after them being active. So, what we found out that unfortunately all of them had more had one or more problems. The first one is that they had an incomplete coverage of the navigator object. So I would change the user agent, but I wouldn't change, for example, the platform. So now I was, you know, I was Internet Explorer landing on Linux. Um, you also there were some that were um, randomizing attributes. So they were, you know, these allowed for impossible configuration. So you had. Your browser pretending to, you know, pretending to be an iPhone, but having a screen size of a desktop computer. And finally, some were forgetting that the user agent is communicated both through your JavaScript environment as well as your HTTP header. So they were changing one, but they were forgetting the other. So you know that is straightforwardly revealable. And the thing is that you know you may think that okay, so we tried and we failed and we're back to where we started, but that's not true. And since I'm a Greek, I like using Greek words, and we classify this as an iatrogenic problem. An iatrogenic means something, or, or rather an iatrogenic disease, is a disease that was caused during examination by a doctor or during treatment by a doctor. So you have users that install these in order to hide, but they actually become more visible than before. And you can think about this sort of in a Venn way. Uh, if we assume this big box here to be the entire fingerprintable surface of a, user's, of a browser with all the quirks and all you know, the ordering of properties and everything, you have then the extensions, let's say extension A, B, and C that go in, and they, you know, they first, they all, for example, they all change the navigator.user agent. But then each extension author, he tries to do something more. You know, one would also try to change the platform, or the other one would say, ah, I'll also change the screen size to match. So, but the thing is that, you know, what they cover versus what's not covered is huge. So the first thing you can do is you can definitely use all this part here to find out what is the real browser. So you're back to where you started. But then you can also check for any of these you know, uh, areas that are only 
covered by a single plugin or by a small combination of them. And now you have reduced your anonymity set from 100 million users of, of Firefox to 3,000 users of that specific extension. Okay? And this essentially, you reveal extensions from their side effects because extensions are not enumerable as plugins are in browsers. So um, the, what we've done so far is we've been detecting fingerprinters and we've been raising awareness, both to ourselves and to people in general. So we haven't yet tried to see you know, how would you go about stopping that. And one of the things that we, know, we, that we talked about earlier is what happens if we block fingerprints today? Does, it, does that make it worse? And can we track that over time? And then you know, some things that we're discussing with Ben, for example, if we're going to start modifying the browser, should we all pretend to be the same, like Tor browser does, or you know, like these uh, browser extensions we're trying to do? Or should we rather be a different user every single time, so that I cannot, you know, I'm different, but I'm different than the last time that you saw me, and I'll be different again the next time, so you can still not correlate. So, and these are all open things, and I'd love to discuss these in personal with you if you want. So, to conclude, fingerprinting is a real problem. And browsers are these complex beasts that you can't just go in, change three attributes, and say, now I'm done, you know, let's tackle another problem. Uh, current browser extensions should not be used for privacy reasons. So there are some sites that, some old sites that say, I need Internet Explorer 6 to run. You know, if you have to go to these websites, then you may use them. But you shouldn't have this thing enabled, on, uh, enabled all the time in your browser because it makes you more visible than before. And this is, you know, this is not really a a scientific, I guess, statement, it's more like what I think at this point, is that long-term solutions will most likely not be technical ones. So we may have to say that we'll do our best to identify fingerprinting, we'll do our best to combat it, but then you know, the site has to tell you in the same ways that they do today for cookies, we're using fingerprinting on these sites, are you okay? And then you as a user, you can choose whether you're okay with that or you would rather go to a different website. So that's all, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. So we have a few minutes for questions, so please. So do you feel like this has gotten, I mean, so I've, you know, as someone who's in the field, I've heard of uh, browser fingerprinting for a while. Right. Um, in my opinion, I don't feel like it's really gotten as much, like, uh, common media attention, even though it is prevalent mm -hmm. and easily identifiable, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So what is it? that you think will bring this to public attention, like how Do Not Track has become a thing, or how any of the other, you know. Right. I think that you, know, you had the third party cookies and Do Not Track, they got public attention because they were, they were bigger than fingerprinting and still are. So you have all these self-help tools for third party cookies, but you don't have any self-help tools today for fingerprinting per se. Um, you do, but you don't work. Yeah, any good ones. Um, so I think that. Actually, for the, for the second paper that I mentioned, FP Detective, it was picked up by a lot of outlets, and they sort of everyone talked about it. But you know, the more they talk about it, the less correct it becomes. So at the end, you had websites that invisibly tracked you even though you don't want to. That has nothing to do with fingerprinting. Um, so I guess that's a matter of presenting it to the world in a concise way, and essentially showing, OK, now you clicked, you know, I will not accept third party cookies, but what's left? Yeah. So, I, 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 I would agree that it, the easier you can make this for people to understand, the better it would be and more attention you will get. Uh, however, I think for real, really for people to start paying attention to this, you need to, well, not you, but someone needs to concentrate on the EU's question. And, and that's why I find some of the graphs of who, who's actually mm -hmm. using this tool so interesting. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in so far as you can be show that these tools are being used for some nefarious purpose, then you will start getting a lot right. of attention. Yeah, the, the thing is that people are not very vocal about it. So I sent around 40 emails at the time, and I, we got like two responses, one saying, I cannot tell you anything, yeah. and the other one from the dating site telling me about the civil attacks. Um, so, and this, the, the, the thing is that there is a server-side component to all of this that we, we do not know how it works. So, you know, you have the JavaScript, it runs, it generates a fingerprint, this thing is actually encrypted. So even if you get it directly from the JavaScript library, you cannot look into it as a first-party website. You have to still give it to the fingerprinting service and say, what do you know about that user? And then they give you back information about them, and some of them claim that they have this threat score 
where they correlate you know, the same fingerprint across many websites and they have uh, reputation databases and they say, okay, that guy, you know, he has a low, um, he's not trustworthy, so you should not do business with him. Uh, but all of that is a thing that we don't know about. And as uh, you know, I cannot go online and subscribe to, to these things. I have to go through sales representatives and pretend to be a company. And I, I, well, we haven't done that yet. I don't know if we'll succeed in doing that, but it's, it's much harder than for, for other services. Yeah. Um, so fingerprinting versus just cookie usage. Right. Um, do you think fingerprinting is worse than third party cookies? Um, in the end result is that mm -hmm. these companies are tracking users, right? They're building profiles. Right. Um, so what do you think like versus the two? Because I mean, third party cookies or cookies in general are used by almost 100% of websites right. out there. Right. Um, so, well, there's like multiple layers to this. Um, the thing is that if I give you a unique identifier, and I know for a fact that it's you, so and you bring it back to me, I don't have to correlate things. And you know, if I see two similar fingerprints, decide that it's two users rather than one. Uh, however, fingerprinting has some interesting properties. For example, it works uh, when you transit from the private mode into the non-private mode of your browser. Or, for example, if Flash is used, um, well, I guess that's probably similar with the Flash cookies, that you, know, you have fingerprinting across browsers because it goes through the Flash cookies that are shared by all of your browsers in your system. So today, if you would tackle a problem, I would say you know, just try to stop or limit third-party cookies. But uh, Fingerprinting is currently not legislated in any way. So it doesn't appear anywhere, and people are now starting to think whether this should be. So as long as you have a lot of you know, legal attention on the cookies, then there is this sort of window for people to use fingerprinting to get the same results and not have to expose themselves as you know, we use something that tracks you. Yeah. So, so if you view fingerprinting as just a way to do cookies without cookies, and you see it as, a, uh, as, this an, a, as an attempt to circumvent legal restrictions, mm -hmm. uh, then you could classify this as malware. And if you classify this as malware, it seems like among the classes of malware out there, fingerprinting is quite easy to fingerprint. Right? They, there's a, a, a very clearly defined mm -hmm. subset of things they do, and there's only so many tools for doing them. Right. So if you wanted to fingerprint the fingerprinters, is it, is it that hard, or is it something that you know, we could just do? We, well, you know, we are fingerprinting the fingerprinters in the sense that we know who they are at this point. Uh, but I know from analyzing their code that right now they're not, you know, they're minifying their JavaScript, but they're not per se trying to hide more than that. Um, so the thing is that a lot of the companies, they come out and they say, look, you can use fingerprinting for, for fraud purposes, you know, for detecting fraud. And there is, I think, this is not my area, but there is certain... Um, legal requirements for banks in order to have some sort of anti-fingerprinting measures to protect their customers, uh, and fingerprinting could fit that bill. So it's not, you know, as clear. Yeah. So it's not as clear cut, you know, okay, that's malware, now it's done, and we just consider it as malware. For instance, the, the, um, the native fingerprinting libraries that we isolated for the two companies, we submitted them to VirusTotal, and we got 0 out of 42 engines flagging this as malware. And that was a real DLL, you know, that was loaded into your browser, for the sole reason of fingerprinting you better. So, but none of the companies were saying, you know, this is adware or it's something bad. They were all just flagging it as great. Uh, so I think it's, it's complicated to just call them malware and just uh, yeah, so who, do you talk to, who do you talk to uh, for legal on this? Uh, well, I just read around, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> Have you talked at all to Ben Edelman? To who? Uh, ben Edelman. He's, uh, He's a Harvard uh, Business School professor. He made a career as a grad student exposing adware, okay. and he has both a P, uh, he has uh, both computer science skills and he's okay. uh, got a law degree okay. and an economics degree. So he knows exactly how to attack these guys. Legally. Okay, I, I would I would be happy to talk with him. It sounds good. Yeah, you want to you want to be talking to him? I'll yeah. I'll hook you up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you have any information uh, for like mobile? devices versus right. non-mobile devices. I would think that mobile devices would probably be less fingerprintable since... Yeah, so um, we don't have solid results. What we do know is that users, um, they customize their 
mobile browsers much less than they customize their desktop browsers. And for instance, I talked with a guy from ING two weeks ago that they use fingerprinting as part of protecting their users. And they told me that, oh, fingerprinting does not work for mobile devices. Do you have any good tricks that we can use? <laughs> uh, I said, no. <laughs> um, but uh, at this point, I think it's sort of like an open question. Uh, it, it's probably true that they customize less, but I wonder if they have special APIs that connect, for example, to the Android operating system that could be used also for fingerprinting. Yeah. Would fingerprinting uh, be more effective with HTML5 and stuff? There is, there is some research. For example, um, people have looked to the canvas element of HTML5 where they just they write some text in it and they read it back out as an image. Uh, and they showed that there is a difference when you do this operation on a Linux machine with Chrome, for example, or on a Windows machine with Chrome. Uh, but the results are a bit like there's a difference. We, we're not sure how to quantify it yet. It could be used, but that's it right now. So there was no, like from the code that I analyzed, there was no evidence that they were using that. Yeah. So the porn sites, um, I'm assuming they're doing it because people go into incognito mode, which doesn't allow for the dropping of cookies, so they do it to track users. So I think that's probably one reason. Our, our own theory is for the detection of shared credentials, um, so that you don't buy one subscription and share it with 100 people. Um, so you know they detect whether the same username and password combination is connected to more than one real browsing environments. Do you see sites like Netflix or Hulu using fingerprinting? I, we have, for that right, we haven't, we haven't checked that one. Yeah. The thing is that for our crawling, that's a general problem in crawling that we have, is that you can, it's really hard to go past the authentication wall. So you, know, you will check for all the pages that are publicly accessible, but once things are behind a login form, you have a problem. So, and I would suspect that maybe uh, for Hulu and for, um, for Netflix, that the fingerprinting starts maybe right after you log in. That'd be, that'd be interesting, because I know that um, you know, HBO, HBO mm -hmm. um, has said that you know, they know that people share credentials to watch HBO shows, but they're okay with it because people have to subscribe anyway. So they're okay. still getting the in-person like cable subscriber mm -hmm even though the Scruff subscribers, friends, families might be watching content. Okay, yeah. And I think Netflix has like a 50, 50 sign-in limit or something, like only 50 different users can sign in with the same ID. Oh, okay, I didn't know. So that. I don't know how they detect that. Okay. <laughs> right, so that's, so that's an interesting hypothesis in terms of right. so using so fingerprinting against <laughs> credentials versus right. being able to detect unique people because for privacy sensitive things like porn, people are going into uh, incognito or other methods of managing mm -hmm. um, like their footprints. Yeah, so my, my, my thesis here is that, uh, so fingerprinting happens on the client side. So if you're like this you know, sophisticated attacker, you can claim that the script run and you can send back a fingerprint and you can construct this to have exactly what you want in it. And when they, you know, when they, they open it up at the server side, they will say, okay, this thing run and it's a use that's located in that place of the world. But, uh, but you can falsify all of these, right? It's, it's not easy to do it, uh, but you can. For, for normal people, you can. So they, you know, they don't know how to view source, much, much, more, much less actually modify JavaScript libraries. So I think that today, even though the argument is that fingerprinting can be used a lot for, uh, you know, for fraud detection, I think that if someone wants to go through, he will, be easily, he will easily be able to go through. So, Fingerprinting seems to me to be working much more for the, you know, for the large uh, part of the population that will just browse websites, they will get fingerprinted, and then they will get um, ads based on their fingerprinting. Yeah. Do you see, sorry. No, please. Um, do you see a trend with fingerprinting? Do you think it's go like going up, or right. um, like how fast do you think? We don't know. So we, we do plan to use the, uh, the FB detective tool to use to do a, a longitudinal study where we sort of, you know, we track it for a year and we try to see whether companies try to change or whether more sites are coming in. Um, I have, the, you know, I have this sort of gut feeling that it's growing, uh, but I cannot give you numbers right now. Have you reached out to the extension makers to 
share your findings with them? No. What, what, was, what would their reaction be? Right. Uh, I haven't. So I, I cannot guess their reaction. It's uh, a pretty negative message you're sending. Right? So the thing is that we do not know whether these people are, you know, are making, well, we do know that some of them are, they are saying, oh, this privacy, this privacy, that use our extension. But there's other guys that just, they offer an extension that changes your user agent. So it could be that they're just trying to offer services towards people that try to access specific websites that check your user agent and say, I will not work unless you have that. But we did find, you know, both academic research and underground guides suggesting the use of these. And their large numbers show that even if you downloaded it and installed it to access your, you know, that website, you're still, this thing can still be used against you on other websites that fingerprint you. Yeah. Are there further questions? Okay, well, so let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank you.